Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. In our previous lecture, we talked about Hesiod's delineation in the Theogony of the three generational struggle for power, in which power devolved from Uranos through Kronos to Zeus. In this lecture, we are going to continue discussing the Theogony, looking at how Zeus consolidated his power and divided it with his siblings and the next generation of gods that began to be born through Zeus's various unions with different goddesses. Now, Hesiod begins his account of how Zeus overthrows the Titans by describing three monstrous offspring of Gaia and Uranus, the so-called Hecaton Herres, or the 300 handers, as they are, uh, that term is translated into English. These, Hesiod tells us, were, uh, they had from their shoulders a hundred arms and uh, not to be approached. And each head had, uh, each of them had 50 heads upon his shoulders on their strong limbs. And irresistible was the stubborn strength that was in their great forms. For of all the children that were born of Gaia and Uranos, these were the most terrible. And he adds, they were hated by their own father from the first. And so in the Theomachy, in the, uh, or Titanomachy, as it's often called, the battle between the Olympians and the Titans, Zeus will enlist these three giant monstrous creatures that are kind of hidden in chains underneath the earth. And we are going to now read an extended section of that. It's one of the more gripping passages within the Theogony of Hesiod. First of all, we are told that when first their father, this would now be Uranus, was vexed in his heart with Obriarius and Cotus and Gaius, these are the Hecaton Heres, the three hundred hander, the, the hundred handers. He, Uranus, bound them in cruel bonds because he was jealous of their exceeding manhood and comeliness and great size. And he made them live beneath the wide paved earth where they were afflicted, being set to dwell under the ground at the end of the earth at its great borders in bitter anguish for a long time, and with great grief at heart. But the son of Kronos, this would be Zeus, and the other deathless gods whom rich-haired Rhea bear from union with Kronos, brought them up again to the light at Earth's advising, that is Gaia's advising. For she herself recounted all things to the gods fully, how that with these they would gain victory and a glorious cause to vaunt themselves. For the titan gods, and as many as sprang from Kronos had long been fighting together in stubborn war with, gre with heart grieving toil, the lordly titans from high Ophirus, but the gods, givers of good, whom rich haired Rhea bear in union with Kronos from Olympus. So they, with bitter wrath, were fighting and continually with one another at that time for ten full years. And the hard strife had no close or end for either side, and the issue of the war hung evenly balanced. But when he had provided those three with all things fitting, nectar and ambrosia, which the gods themselves eat, and when their proud spirit revived within them all after they had fed on nectar and delicious ambrosia, then it was that the father of men and gods, Zeus, spoke amongst them. Hear me, bright children of earth and heaven that I may say what my heart within me bids. A long while now have we, who are sprung from Kronos and the Titan gods, fought with each other every day to get victory and to prevail. But do you show your great might and unconquerable strength and face the Titans in bitter strife? For remember our gr friendly kindness and from what sufferings you are come back to the light from your cruel bondage under misty gloom through our counsels. So he said, and blameless Cotus answered him again, Divine one, you speak that which we know well. Nay, even of ourselves we know that your wisdom and understanding is exceeding, and that you became a defender of the deathless ones from chill doom. And through your devising we are come back again from the murky gloom and from our merciless bonds, enjoying what we looked not for, O Lord, son of Kronos. And so now, with fixed purpose and deliberate counsel, we will aid your power in dreadful strife and will fight against the titans in hard battle. So he said, and the gods, giver of good things, applauded when they heard his word. 
and their spirit longed for war even more than before. And they all, both male and female, stirred up hated battle that day, the titan gods and all that were born of Kronos together with those dread mighty ones of overwhelming strength whom Zeus brought up to the light from Erebus beneath the earth. An hundred arms sprang from the shoulders of all alike, and each had fifty heads growing upon his shoulders, upon stout limbs. These then stood against the titans in grim strife, holding huge rocks in their strong hands. And on the other part, the titans eagerly strengthened their ranks, and both sides at one time showed the work of their hands and their might. The boundless sea rang terribly around, and the earth crashed loudly. Wide heaven was shaken and groaned, and high Olympus reeled from its foundation under the charge of the undying gods, and a heavy quaking reached dim Tartarus, and the deep sound of their feet in the fearful onset of their hard missiles. So then they launched their grievous shafts upon one another, and the cry of both armies as they shouted reached the starry heaven, and they met together with a great battle cry. Then Zeus no longer held back his might, but straight his heart was filled with fury, and he showed forth all his strength. From heaven and from Olympus he came forthwith, hurling his lightning. The bolts flew thick and fast from his strong hand together, with thunder and lightning, whirling an awesome flame. The life-giving earth crashed around and burning, and the vast wood crackled loud with fire all around. All the land seethed, and ocean streams and the unfruitful sea. The hot vapor lapped around the earth-born titans. Flame unspeakable rose to the bright upper air. The flashing glare of the thunderstone and lightning blinded their eyes for all that there were strong. Astounding heat seized chaos, and to see with eyes, and to hear the sound with ears, it seemed as if heaven and wide earth above came together, for such a mighty crash would have arisen if earth were being hurled to ruin, and heaven from on high were hurling her down. So great a crash was there, while the gods were meeting together in strife. Also the winds brought rumbling earthquake and dust storm, thunder and lightning, and the lurid thunderbolt, which are the shafts of great Zeus, and carried the clangor and the war cry into the midst of the two hosts. An horrible uproar of terrible strife arose, mighty deeds were shown, and the battle inclined, but until then they kept at one another and fought continually in cruel war. And amongst the foremost, Cotus and Briarios and Gaius, insatiate for war, raised fierce fighting. Three hundred rocks, one upon another, they launched from their strong hands and overshadowed the titans with their missiles and buried them beneath the wide paved earth and bound them in bitter chains when they had conquered them by their strength for all their great spirit, as far beneath the earth to Tartarus. For a brazen anvil falling down from heaven, nine days and nights would reach the earth upon the tenth, and again a brazen anvil falling from earth nine nights and days would reach Tartarus upon the tenth. Round it runs a fence of bronze, and night spreads in triple line all about it like a neck circlet, while above grow the roots of the earth and the unfruitful sea. There, by the counsel of Zeus, who drives the clouds, the titan's gods, the titan gods are hidden under misty gloom, in a dank place where are the ends of the huge earth. And they may na not go out, for Poseidon fixed gates of bronze upon it, and a wall runs all around it on every side. There Gaius and Cotus and great-souled Obriarius live, trusty warders of Zeus who holds the Aegis. Okay, my friends, a very rousing tale indeed. After overthrowing the Titans, Zeus consolidates his power and becomes now the primary ruler of the gods, which he will continue to be for as long as the universe lasts. That is, in a sense, the one major narrative thread that runs throughout the entire Theogony of Hesiod. This is sort of the main point that unites everything, all the other digressions and everything else. There will be no further struggles of sons to overthrow their fathers, and no further shift of power down the generations. Zeus is now in control. He is the head god, and he will remain so for as long as the universe lasts, says the Theogony. And of course, Hesiod never explains that part of it, 
uh, which I have just said. Hesiod never comes right out and says Zeus is now in power and will remain so. This is the end of the struggle of, for power that crosses generations because Zeus is going to rule forever. He doesn't come out and do that because um, we have, and this is a, something that's very important for our study of classical myth or any mythology. Hesiod and his audience assume the reality of Zeus and the other gods. For them, these gods are really there. They are the gods. And so the, this is an accurate picture of how the universe works. Accordingly, everyone knows that Zeus will remain in power. There can be no question of Zeus not remaining there. Uh, that is a given of Hesiod's society, and everyone listening to Hesiod's work at the time it was composed would know perfectly well that it was Zeus's rise to power toward which the whole story was tending from the very beginning that everything was leading up to it, in a sense, and was heading towards Zeus's accession to power. Because this is known to everyone, it is not necessary to state it straightforwardly in Hesiod's narrative. And this is a very important point to remember any time we look at any myth. Narrative points seem from the outside wholly arbitrary. Various different points um, don't seem to, you know, why some things are accentuated and some things are left out seems to be arbitrary. Why should Zeus become the head god over somebody else, you might ask? Why should Zeus not be overthrown by a son later on as he overthrew his father and how his father overthrew his father? Well, from within the culture that created these stories, these points are not arbitrary at all. They are necessary because they are reflections of what that culture perceived as reality. Zeus, for them, was and is and will remain king of the gods, ruler of the gods. He divides uh, power amongst his, himself and his brothers, but he still is the main ruler. This is one of his first acts uh, once he is in power. It is a division that is often referred to by Greek authors as the triple division, uh, with no further explanation than that, because everyone knew what the triple division referred to. Zeus and his two brothers, Hades and Poseidon, are, all are allocated by Zeus now. They're different portions. They're different lots, as it were. Hades becomes Lord of Tartarus, the underworld. At this point, Hades goes literally bodily into Tartarus and lives there. He becomes king of the dead. And he does not come back to Mount Olympus, where Zeus and his siblings live, uh, and, where and Hades' his own siblings live. And Hades does not really take much part in the doings of, of myth after this, except for some things that, uh, obviously things that are associated with the land of the dead. Uh, and in fact, his identification with Tartarus becomes so close that in fact, his name Hades comes really to be another synonym for the land of the dead. Um, and Tartarus and Hades basically are synonymous. Um, uh, but, and occasionally he will pop up. We're going to read the Homeric hymn to uh, Demeter in some time and uh and you'll see he's a, obviously a character in that but for the most part he, he really doesn't have much dealings in myth he's not really mentioned very often uh poseidon becomes ruler of the seas and of waters in general poseidon does not personify the sea per se pontos is still there pontos has not gone away but poseidon is given power over the seas and over waters in general he also is the god who is supposed to send earthquakes and that is one of the uh, epithets that he gets the, of Poseidon, the earth shaker. He controls earthquakes as well as water. Zeus becomes ruler of the sky, and as such, he controls the thunderbolt, the lightning bolt, which he can hurl as his weapon. So theoretically, all three brothers share power over the earth. In practice, the earth, though, becomes Zeus's domain. Poseidon very seldom exerts power over the earth, and Hades very seldom, if ever, has any direct control over the things of the earth. So the earth, in effect, though, even though it's supposed to be common to all three, each one has their own specific lot, but the earth is common to all, the earth, in effect, becomes Zeus's domain, as well as does most of the workings of human society. So while this is called the triple division, and supposedly Zeus divides these shares of power amongst himself and his two brothers, in actuality, it is more as though Zeus divides the world into four parts, earth, sky, sea, and underworld giving one-fourth to each of his brothers and keeping half for himself. That would be the more accurate way of looking at it, I think. Zeus is definitely the upper hand in the division of power. Now, Zeus's sisters also have their particular role. Um, Hera, as we will talk about later uh, in this lecture, is the patron goddess of marriage and of married women. 
She is also Zeus's permanent wife. Hestia, who is uh, another one of um, uh, Zeus's sisters, she is the goddess of the hearth. Hestia's case is a good one for reminding ourselves that myth and religion are by no means synonymous. They are certainly overlapping categories, but they are not the same. And the reason why I say this about Hestia is that Hestus is the goddess of the hearth. Her name, Hestia, literally means hearth. It is etymologically related to the Latin word Vesta, as in the Vestal Virgins, who were the um uh who were the goddess, oh, sorry, who were the priestesses who were supposed to tend the eternal flame in Rome. Um, and as such, as as the goddess of the hearth, she must have been one of the most important goddesses in day-to-day -day religious life, especially for uh, people, women in the domestic sphere, and uh, the religious experiences of most Greek people. The hearth is both the literal and metaphorical center of the household. The hearth, the fireplace, obviously allows for heat, light, cooking, uh, cooking food, heating water, for all the processes that are necessary for civil civilized life. And therefore, the hearth is absolutely crucial. It can be set as the focal point of the home. In fact, uh, that actually is, is uh, I'm kind of making a pun there, because the Latin word focus actually literally means hearth, and that is where we get the word from for focus. But you get the idea. It's the focal point of the house. And yet, even though it would have been so, she would have been such an important person, you know, no doubt women would have prayed to her before they, you know, lit the oven or whatever and, uh, you know, cooked their food and did all sorts of things in the house. Nevertheless, we have almost no myths about Hestia at all. She does not show up in literature really almost ever. She is mentioned now and then, but there are really almost no stories associated with her. And if, therefore, we were to judge the importance of a god in religion, purely based on that god's appearance in literature, we would have to say that Hestia is negligible, and yet everything else we know about Greek religion would indicate that she is actually central. And this is just a reminder that the two categories of myth and religion do not always overlap nearly as neatly as one would think they would. Now, uh, Zeus does have another sister. I've talked about Hera, I've talked about Hestia, also Demeter. Zeus's remaining sister, is, Demeter, is the goddess of grain and of agriculture. Uh, she takes part in some very important myths, most importantly among them the story of the loss of her daughter Persephone, which I uh, mentioned just a moment ago we are going to be reading at some length uh, in, a, in a later lecture. As ruler, Zeus not only gains physical control over the sky and earth, he also takes as part of his domain control over the government of various abstract concepts having to do with human society and the orderly working of human society. First and foremost, Zeus oversees justice. Zeus is the god who stands behind justice, who backs up justice, who punishes uh, the breaking of oaths, um, and who validates the swearing of oaths. He is also the god of Xenia, the patron god of an extraordinarily important concept and institution in Greek culture, that we really have no proper analog for in the modern day age. Xenia is often trans translated as the guest host relationship or more loosely as hospitality in general. Neither of those two translations, however, capture just how crucially important the concept of Xenia was in archaic Greek society and even subsequent Greek society. Um, it, is all, it is a concept that runs all throughout the Iliad and the Odyssey, particularly the Odyssey. Uh, all throughout the early books, the idea of basically in a day and age where there were no hotels and no institutions of any kind, really, if you were to travel to any other place, you uh, you could expect, uh, and it was a customary thing to expect, hospitality by a person of your social rank. Okay, so, you know, if you were exceptionally poor and a vagabond, you couldn't just go to the king's palace and expect to be put up for two months. Um but if you were of a very high social status, then you could, or, you know, some, so in, in, in like for like. Um, and those relationships, uh, there were certain duties that were incumbent upon the guest to feed and clothe and take care of the person as they came, um, and then to even give them a gift, uh, and then to allow them to go on their way, not to, not to detain them. And this is all very spelled out, especially in the first four books of the Odyssey. Uh, and But of course, the, the guest had certain rules and, and responsibilities that he had to follow. Of course, you couldn't do any harm to the person who was taking care of you. You couldn't, you know, you shouldn't um, 
you know, damage their property. And, and of course, uh, actually, the whole basis of the entire Trojan War is predicated on a violation of Xenia. Uh, it is the fact that Paris, the Trojan prince, went to the house of the king of Sparta, Menelaus, and uh, as, a, as a xenos, as a guest friend, and instead of abiding by the rules of Xenia and, you know, being respectful of his host, he went, ran off with his wife, Helen of Troy, was originally Helen of Sparta. Uh, and she, hers, of course, was the face that launched the thousand ships. So in other words, the Greeks launched this huge armada to go and get her back. And the whole history of the, of the Trojan War follows from that. The whole saga, I should say, uh, loosely based on some bit of history. We'll talk much more about that later on in a different lecture. But the point, though, is that um, this violation of Xenia was taken extremely seriously. And Zeus was the god who oversaw that relationship. If you read, I think it's in um, Book 3 of the uh, of the Iliad, when... Um, Menelaus and and Paris are into a duel, getting into a duel to to you know avenge. And he's trying to avenge what Paris has done to his wife. Menelaus utters a prayer to Zeus Xenios as he hurls a spear at um at Paris. So, you know, so in other words, praying to Zeus who oversees the institution of Xenia. Zeus also uh, is the god that oversees prophecy particularly at his shrine at a place called Dodona. Uh, this is what you see in front of you uh, on the screen. Dodona was one of his main uh, shrines in northern Greece, north northwestern Greece. Zeus' son Apollo, whom we will also talk about in a discreet lecture, is the god of prophecy and is probably the most important god of prophecy in Greek myth. Uh, it is Apollo who oversees the oracle at Delphi, for instance, the most important oracular shrine in all of Greece. But Apollo makes it quite clear on several occasions in literature that his control of prophecy, his prophetic gift, is handed to him by Zeus. It is given to him by Zeus, and it is therefore not his own property in a sense. He even says at times that what he is doing when he gives prophecy is prophesying the will of Zeus. Okay, uh, Zeus, in other words, is the god who is most directly associated with prophecy, and he gives control over prophecy to Apollo as a kind of lending out of his control of prophecy. But Zeus is the main prophetic god. And I, this brings in a separate point. Zeus's connection with prophecy emphasizes both his wisdom and his power in Greek myth. Prophets like Apollo uh, often say that they are foretelling the will of Zeus and what is going to happen. And there are many times in Greek literature when the things that take place are described as the will of Zeus coming to pass. And to, just to give you the most kind of illustrative example of this, I will now read for you the opening lines, the invocation of the Iliad, which describes uh, you know the events uh, early on in the in the Iliad, um, and but basically how the whole the whole storyline is an unfolding of the uh, uh, of of the, the the will of Zeus. I'm going to read it for you in Greek first. Just give you the first seven lines. Remember, in the if you listen to my other lectures, you'll know about the dactylic hexameter rhythm, which is based on quantity as opposed to stress, and the musical pitch accents. Just listen. Man and I that I are, audio Achilleos, Ulomenen Hemeria Kai Ois Alge Etteke. Olas diptimus psukasaidi proiapsin, heroon autus de heloria teo ke cunesin, oi on nois te passi dios de telete bule, exute ta prota diestate arresante, atraides te anaxandron kai dios achilleos. The wrath, sing, goddess, of Peleus' son Achilles, that destructive wrath which brought countless woes upon the Achaeans and sent forth to Hades many valiant souls of heroes and made them spoil for dogs and every bird. Thus the will of Zeus came to fulfillment. From the time when first they parted in strife, Atreus' son, king of men, and brilliant Achilles. Now, Returning to our description of Zeus, once he has established himself as ruler of the gods and divided his power with his brothers, and once he kind of becomes sort of the institutionalized um, uh, person who oversees these various different things that we mentioned, and he establishes his sisters in their domains, um, 
Zeus starts to meet with various different goddesses. His first wife, or first mate, uh, if, in, in the sense of uh, uh, mating with one, is the minor goddess Metis. It is not clear if he actually marries her or just mates with her. In any case, she is his first partner. And the important thing about Metis is that she is fated, we are told the fates have decreed, that she would bear a son who would overthrow his father. Thus, repeating the pattern we saw in the earlier generations, just as Kronos overthrew Uranos and Zeus overthrew Kronos, Metis is supposed to bear a son who will overthrow his father. Hesiod says the following about this. Now Zeus, king of the gods, made Metis his first wife, and she was wisest among gods and mortal men. But when she was about to bring forth the goddess bright-eyed Athena, Zeus craftily deceived her with cunning words and put her in his own belly, as earth and starry heaven advised. For they advised him so, to the end that no other should hold royal sway over the eternal gods in place of Zeus. For very wise children were destined to be born of her, first the maiden bright-eyed Tritogenia, Athena, equal to her father in strength and in wise understanding, but afterwards she was to bear a son of overbearing spirit, king of gods and men. But Zeus put her into his own belly, first that the goddess might devise for him both good and evil. As we looked at in our last lecture, Kronos takes a hint from the mistakes of Uranos and doesn't leave the children inside his wife, but swallows them. Zeus takes a hint from the troubles of Kronos and doesn't wait until the children are born to swallow them, but swallows the wife before she can conceive the troublesome son. She has already conceived the daughter in question, and the daughter is Athena, Tritogenia, one of Athena's titles, uh, and Athena will eventually be born from Zeus's head. Uh, just as Zeus's siblings remained alive inside Kronos's body, so Athena remains alive inside of Zeus's head, as it were, uh, or somewhere inside of him, but she, she is born from his head. Um, and whenever that gestation period is finished, Athena does come out fully formed. There are various works of art uh, showing this, um, and uh, it, is, it is one of the more common uh, motifs, actually. The story goes that um, usually some god, but typically Hephaestus, the blacksmith god, hits Zeus over the forehead with an axe. His head splits open and out springs Athena, fully grown and wearing armor. Uh, a very interesting subject to be portrayed in art. The son who is destined to overthrow his father is never conceived, therefore, and never born. Zeus is never going to be overthrown, therefore. And this is one of the very few times in Greek myth that anyone, even Zeus, successfully circumvents the workings of fate. Now, speaking of fate, this is a major concept, um, but let's hold off on that in one second. Let's give some analysis of this thing about Metis and Athena. Like so much else in the Theogony, the story of Metis and her daughter Athena offers several interesting interpretive points. First, it is the only time anyone successfully overthrows fate. And this highlights and introduces the concept of fate, which affects gods as well as humans. You see, fate or destiny is a huge topic in classical culture and classical mythology. It is very hard to get an exact handle on precisely how fate works. It is a force independent of Zeus. And while prophets may say they are foretelling the will of Zeus, side by side with that will is the very strong sense that the fates operate independently, separately, uh, over above Zeus, and that even Zeus himself, normally speaking, cannot counteract the workings of fate. This is a very um, interesting concept, and actually, as just to give one kind of small hint of what is to come in a later lecture, um, different scholars of the modern period have noted that it was this fact that fate kind of existed as its own law over above even the gods that first prompted the first philosophers of ancient Greece to begin an exploration of what we know of as, as philosophy and the, the attempt to rationally understand the world around us um, and its workings through reason as opposed to mythology in an attempt to kind of get at the underlying structure of things, that the initial impetus for that search came from this deep intuition that even the gods themselves are kind of bound in some ways by law. 
by the workings that they themselves cannot circumvent. This is really one. This is the this story of Metis and Athena, and and uh, really is the exception that proves the rule. There is a very famous scene that illustrates exactly what I'm talking about, um, of how Zeus himself is bound by the workings of fate. Uh, there's a scene from Homer's Iliad in which Zeus thinks about intervening in the battle that is going on at that moment to save the son of, of so sorry, to save the life of his human son, Sarpedon, who is a Trojan about to be killed. And he's about to do it, but then Hera comes and reminds him that Sarpedon is fated to die and that Zeus would uh, would be kind of working against fate. He would, he'd, and he does not have the right to interfere with the workings of fate. And Zeus agrees and let Sarpedon die, though he weeps bitterly for him. Let us just read that scene. And the son of crooked counseling Kronos took pity when he saw them, and spake to Hera, his sister and his wife, Ah, woe is me, for that it is fated that Sarpedon, dearest of men to me, be slain by Patroclus, the son of Benoitius. And in twofold wise is my heart divided in counsel, as I ponder in my heart whether I shall snatch him up while yet he liveth, and set him afar from the tearful war in the rich land of Lycia, or whether I shall slay him now beneath the hands of the son of Anoitius. Then oxide queenly Hera answered him, Most dread son of Cronos, what a word hast thou said? A man that is mortal, doomed long since by fate, art thou minded to deliver again from dolor his death? Do as thou wilt, but be sure that we other gods have sent not all thereto. And another thing will I tell thee, and do thou lay it to heart. If thou send Sarpet on living to his house, he think thee, lest hereafter some other god also be minded to send his own dear son away from the fierce conflict. For many there be, fighting around the great city of Priam, that are sons of the immortals, and among the gods wilt thou send dread wrath. But, and if he be dear to thee, and thine heart be grieved, suffer thou him verily to be slain in the fierce conflict beneath the hands of Patroclus, son of Anoitius, what when his soul and life have left him? Then send thou death and sweet sleep to bear him away until they come to the land of wide Lycia, and there shall his brethren and his kinsfolk give him burial with mound and pillar, for this is the dew of the dead. So spake she, and the father of men and gods failed not to hearken, albeit he shed bloody raindrops on the earth, showing honour to his dear son his own son whom Patroclus was about to slay in the deep-soiled land of Troy, far from his native land. And you see right here a very ancient uh, vase, uh, a crater, actually, a mixing bowl, that for many years was on display in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. I remember seeing it myself as a child um, growing up in New York, but it has since been returned to Greece. Um and uh, you see, this is the body of Sarpedon. You can, if you read Greek letters, you can see that coming out basically from his armpit there. And then uh, Hypnos and Thanatos are the one. Sleep and death are the two figures that are coming to take away. And Hermes, who we will also meet in a later lecture, is the third figure standing behind Sarpedon. Um, but the point, though, is that Zeus has to bow to the demands of fate. And there is one more scene also from the Iliad that I would like to read to you of the death of Hector, when Hector is being chased around the walls of Troy by Achilles, who's about to kill him. And uh, and Zeus says the following lines, Then among these the father of men and gods was first to speak, Look you now, in sooth a well-loved man do mine eyes behold, pursued around the wall, and my heart hath sorrow for Hector, for who hath burned for me many thighs of oxen on the crests of many ridged Ida and at other times on the topmost citadel. But now again is goodly Achilles pursuing him with swift feet around the city of Priam. Nay then, come ye gods, bethink you, and take counsel whether we shall save him from death, or now at length shall slay him, good man though he be, by the hand of Achilles, son of Peleus. But when for the fourth time they were come to the springs, lo, then the father lifted on high his golden scales, and set therein two fates of grievous death, one for Achilles and one for horse-taming Hector. Then he grasped the balance by the midst and raised it, and down sank the day of doom of Hector, and departed unto Hades, and Phoebus Apollo left him, that is, left Hector. 
So you see, even Zeus here has to weigh the fates, and Hector's goes down. So he is looking to an external standard, which is fate. Keep your eye on that. And I just, I just am introducing you to the concept now, but we will see that on other occasions going forward. And returning to the story of Metis and Athena, the swallowing of Metis, therefore, and the circumvention of the conception of the fated son who would overthrow Zeus is a very unusual thing. As I say, it is the, the exception that proves the rule. Because normally fate functions as a reminder that even Zeus is not omnipotent, as we talked about uh, before in our earlier lectures. Fate is sometimes treated as an abstract concept, uh, but sometimes it is also personified uh, as three goddesses who are called the Moirai in, fate, in, in, in Greek, uh, the fates, who are daughters of Zeus and another minor goddess named Themis, which basically means right order or uh, something like that. Um, law, you could even say. Here is a passage from the Theogony that describes the birth of the destinies, the, the Moirai. And night also bear the destinies, Moirai and ruthless avenging fates, Clotho and Lachesis and Atropos, who give men at their birth both evil and good to have. And they pursue the transgressors until uh, of men and of gods. And these goddesses never cease from their dread anger until they punish the sinner with a sore penalty. Um, I mentioned that they were children of Themis, uh, but Hesiod has them be daughters of night. As you see, there's different traditions out there, uh, as we've talked about before. So again, the swallowing of Metis gives us an interesting take on fate. It is the exception that proves the rule, that fate cannot normally be circumvented. It also can be seen as the moment at which the male power, the power of male gods, is finally irrevocably established over the female goddesses. Because up until this point, it has been a little bit questionable, hasn't it been? These mother goddesses have seemed awfully powerful. They have conspired with younger sons to overthrow fathers up until this point. But when Zeus circumvents any of that by swallowing Metis, one way to read what is going on here is to say that this is the moment in which male dominance, patriarchal oppression, if you like, is firmly established and remains so in Greek culture uh, and, in, of course, in Greek myth. The act is also important, I think, at the point at which Zeus matures. Um, that is, he becomes a fully competent ruler. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have to do a little bit of an allegorical interpretation to explain what I mean. And an allegorical interpretation here works exceptionally well for this myth. Zeus is a young ruler up until this point. He has just come into power. He has power and dominance. What else does a ruler need to rule well besides power and dominance? Well, to rule well, a ruler needs wisdom. He must be a wise ruler. And so the word metis means counsel or shrewdness or uh, you know, shrewd plan, stratagem, something like that. Wisdom might be putting it a little bit too far, but Metis as a concept means counsel or stratagem or plan, something like that. And so when Zeus, uh, and I just kind of mentioned the fact that many of these minor goddesses have names that are as abstract uh, con concepts. So Metis here personifies counsel or shrewdness or stratagem. And uh, there are other goddesses of justice or order, peace. I mentioned Themis a moment ago. Um, so Metis personifies this idea of counsel or stratagem. Zeus needs this sort of shrewdness in order to rule properly. And thus, when he swallows Metis, he is in effect incorporating literally uh, counsel into himself. Hesiod says he lodged her in his belly so that she might advise him in matters of good and evil. Um, evil, of course, is a, is a difficult, uh, perhaps a mistranslation of the word kakia here, um, because there really wasn't so much of a concept of evil, and, and that, that concept is very much a, a Christian biblical concept. So, um, But good and ill, we might say. He, he advised her in matters of good and ill. He lodged her in his belly so that she might advise him in order to explain uh, that concept, though. I need to kind of give you a little bit of background. Why is it that the idea of having something as an intellectual concept in your stomach um, why does that make sense? Well, you have to understand a little bit about Greek physiology to understand what that means. Hesiod and these other archaic Greeks of this time, uh, Greeks really who lived uh, even a long time after Hesiod, did not know that thought takes place in the head. 
They were not aware of that, it seems. And strange as that sounds, uh, that they wouldn't have understood that thought takes place in your head. Um, it actually makes sense on some level that they didn't understand that because we don't have any sensory nerve endings in our brains at all. We do not feel what is going on in our brains. Um, he see it in his contemporaries, and as I said, later Greeks as well, believe that thought took place in the midriff. In fact, the word that is oftentimes translated as wits or even one's mind or something like that is phrenes. Okay, the frame is the midriff, the kind of area of the torso. Um, now, that is not quite as bizarre as it sounds, <laughs> if you think about it with your head, of course. Uh, because if we think about it, we will realize that we do feel emotions uh, in our torsos, in our midriff, uh, right? When we feel very afraid, when we feel anxious, even uh, happiness, or certainly things like anger and stuff like that, we don't feel them in our brain. But we do feel them in our midriff. We feel them in our torso. And we still have lots of expressions about this in our language, right? We all know what butterflies in the stomach mean. We all know what it means to have a gut feeling about something or to, to feel that was, you know, when some bad news happens, it's like a punch in the guts. Uh, all of these expressions reflect our realization uh, that we feel our mental states to a large degree in our torsos and, and not in our brains. The Greeks thought that this is therefore where mental cognition takes place. And uh, even in this last passage, the, or a couple of passages a moment ago, that one about Sarpedon, where Hera says to Zeus, you know, I will say this to you and lay it up in your heart uh, or in your mind, however it was that it was translated. The Latin word there, I'm sorry, the Greek word would be phren. It would be the, the midriff, okay, cast it into your midriff. They weren't stupid, the ancient Greeks, obviously. Some of the clearest evidence that thought takes place in the brain uh, that we uh, that 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 first indicated to modern science that people think not in their stomachs but in their brain happened when people had brain injuries, severe head injuries, which unfortunately happen all too often. Um, the impact of a head injury on the thought process of a person, uh, you know, was one of the big things that we could, you know, study and understand, begin to kind of the whole process of modern understanding of what the brain actually does. Uh, Phineas Gage, if you want to look into that case, a very interesting case there. Uh, the first person to get a lobotomy, basically, by accident. Um, but in the ancient world, in any time before the intervention, I'm sorry, the invention of modern medicine, an injury severe enough to cause brain damage would almost undoubtedly be severe enough to kill that person. So while the ancient Greeks knew that there was stuff in our head, there is a word for brain and kephalon, which simply means the stuff in your head. Uh, and, and Homer talks about soldiers, you know, having a a spear go through their head and the and the and Gavilon comes out, you know, and stuff like that. Um, they knew that whatever was in there was important. If you split someone's head open with an axe, um, you know, anyone besides Zeus, uh, <laughs> that person is going to drop dead. But they didn't know exactly what was so important about that stuff. Um, one theory was that it was uh, the, among the ancient Greeks for what the stuff in your head did was that it was a regulatory system for heat. That's what Aristotle believed and that it controlled the heat or coolness of the body. Another theory was that it was the source of important bodily fluids, uh, such as blood or bone marrow, but it was certainly not the seat of thought. Now, again, returning to Zeus and Metis, this means that when Zeus puts Metis in his belly, he is putting uh, stratagem, counsel, shrewdness, right into where he needs it to think about. It also means that this very modern interpretation of the birth of Athena, something that uh, we will see uh, in, in if, we, if we read modern handbooks about myth, that Athena springs forth from Zeus's head because she is the goddess of wisdom and that she is, uh, and that therefore that is the proper place for her to spring from. That just doesn't work, I'm afraid. Athena is a goddess associated with wisdom, but that cannot be what is associated with her springing out of Zeus's brow. Um, I think that is probably a connection with the belief that the brain um, maybe is the source of the generative uh, power within a man. Uh, that is one of the uh, ideas that the ancient Greeks did have, as I kind of was talking about. And so this idea that, you know, this that this was the place where generative bodily fluids or originate from, that might have been the reason why she was depicted as coming forth from Zeus's head. Um, or it could be an association with the head as the top of the body, uh, the crowning point, the highest point, and therefore kind of the place of honor, uh, a word that is used for head 
can also mean the top of a hill in Greek or a mountain. So it gives Athena a kind of majesty that she comes out of the head of Zeus. Whatever the case may be, it's not the fact that she's the goddess of wisdom and therefore comes out of his head for that reason. Well, after swallowing Metis, the uh, you know stratagem, counsel, plan, um, and after the birth of Athena, Zeus then mates with various other goddesses, minor goddesses, and produces several children before he marries and settles down, as it were, with his lasting wife, Hera. Now, Hera, as I said, is the patron goddess of marriage and of married women, and yet her marriage with Zeus is neither happy nor very productive. She and Zeus have difficulties producing acceptable sons. They have two daughters, Hebe, whose name means youthful beauty or bloom of youth or adolescence, um, the moment, uh, the idea in Greek is that it's the moment when a young girl is at her most beautiful point. That's Hebe. And uh, Zeus and Hera's second daughter is called Elethuia, which who was the goddess of childbirth. Um, they have, this would be the Latin Lucina. Um, they have one daughter, therefore, who personifies the exact moment at which a girl kind of is of marriageable age, and another who personifies childbirth, both of which fit very well with Hera kind of being the goddess of marriage. Their son, however, is Ares, god of war, of whom Zeus himself says in the Iliad that all the other gods hate. Hera has a second son, Hephaestus, the blacksmith god, but according to most versions of Hephaestus's birth, he was born uh, without Zeus. Hera gave birth to him without mating with Zeus because she was angry that Zeus had Athena. And while Athena in many ways is kind of the most splendid goddess among the uh, Olympians, Hera's attempt to produce a male child on her own results in Hephaestus, who is lame, ugly, and not a very satisfactory god in many ways. So Zeus and Hera do not have flourishing offspring, as you might expect they would. Zeus also mates with not only other goddesses, but with various mortal women, such as Alcmene, the mother of the hero Heracles, who we'll do a whole lesson on later. One theme that runs throughout Greek myth um, is the idea that Hera hates and makes trouble for Zeus's sons by mortal women. She is not entirely pleased, therefore, when Zeus has all these other goddesses as consorts, but she particularly hates the, the idea that a mortal woman could replace could produce a son with Zeus when she herself has not been particularly successful in that regard. She is um, really uh, has a lot of hatred for Zeus's sons by mortal women. In fact, the hatred of Hera is a motivating force behind most of the adventures of Hercules, Heracles. But as I said, we will hold off on talking about him until a much later lecture. However, many of the unions uh, that the, many of Zeus's unions are with conceptual goddesses. By that I mean maidens with goddesses such as Metis, stratagem, Themis, whose name means right order or the right functioning of society and the world in general. These maidens produce offspring like justice, the concept. Zeus's mates with right order, therefore, and produce and this ju this the, the daughter that is produced justice. That is a fairly transparent way of talking about Zeus's attributes as a ruler, making him the father of justice. I and mean, we might even use that expression in our own modern day times. But in mythological terms, it had this literal meaning of actually fathering the child whose name is justice. But it certainly underlies the idea that Zeus supervises justice, and that justice is part of his domain. Now, all of these unions also repeat a pattern that we saw earlier in, in mythology in prior generations. Hesiod, as I have said, describes the coming into existence of everything and therefore uses these unions of anthropomorphic gods to describe how everything comes into existence. If such abstractions exist, like justice, then they must have come about somehow. And the only way that that is possible in myth mythological terms is through reproduction. And so justice itself, being an anthropomorphic goddess, uh, it is reasonable in this context to have Zeus be the father. Okay, Because after all, as, the, as one of his earliest terms or titles, epithets, is, as found in the Iliad, is, is pater andronte theonte, that is the father of gods and men. Um, and so it is almost by necessity that he pairs off with different concepts to produce yet other concepts, right? That is the means that he see it has to talk about how the world and all of its multifaceted nature comes into existence. 
Another explanation for Zeus's frequent unions with minor goddesses and even mortal women is that this may well reflect the synthesis of traditions about various local gods. Greek religion, belief in the Olympians and all the stories coming from the Olympians did not spring fully grown from the earth like Athena coming out of Zeus's brow. It developed over a period of many centuries. And it is safe to assume, therefore, that as it developed, it also spread in some areas of Greece that had not originally perhaps believed in Zeus and the Olympians came to believe in them. Most places would have had local traditions and stories about their own gods. And when they did come to believe in Zeus, there would be a strong tendency to say, ah, the stories we have told about this local deity were really about Zeus instead. We called him something else. Now we know his name is really Zeus and kind of identify him with him. That's why oftentimes you'll see in Greek mythology and literature and certainly in Greek religion, gods are referred to with cultic names. So there's not it's not just Zeus, but it's, as I said before about the Iliad, Zeus Xenios or Zeus of Dodona or Apollo of Delphi. But there's also Apollo of um, of other places, you know, where he has shrines. And, and uh, so they're all kind of localized in their in their worship. Uh, and this comes from the fact that there were all these complete competing traditions and earlier stories coming from a local level that then kind of get synthesized. Along with that, there is probably a reluctance to give up stories about local heroines who had mated with this local god, a local queen, for instance, who had been married by this god, a local goddess who had been married by such and such a god. And so you simply graft all of those stories on together. And this means that Zeus, by necessity, becomes a god who has mated with many different females. Uh, but it really standing behind the whole all of these kind of crazy stories is the sociological principle that undergirds all of paganism, and that is called syncretism. Religious syncretism basically means putting together various different traditions, adding other traditions onto the stories about a particular god or goddess, and kind of blending it all together. Paganism in general was very syncretistic. It was not exclusive. There was nothing like the first commandment in paganism. You know, obviously, the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, and you will have no other gods before me. There was nothing like that. The ancient Greeks and, and the Romans too, and Egyptians, basically all of these ancient cultures um, the more gods, the better. You wanted to have as many of them on your side, you know, in whatever way you could. Um, there was even a temple in Rome called the Pantheon, which means a temple of all the gods. Returning now to the Theogony, by the end of the Theogony, we might ask, what sort of picture of the gods and goddesses do we have? Well, there are several important characteristics that I want to enumerate at this point, just to pull it all together and to kind of uh, get like one totalizing vision. These gods, as we've said many times, are highly anthropomorphic. They share many of humanity's characteristics. We are so accustomed to classical mythology as our primary example of what mythology is and how it works. Um, and we know this culture uh, was polytheistic. It believed in many gods. And so that may not seem as a surprising uh, thing to us that the gods were anthropomorphic. And you might be saying, well, of course they are. How would the gods be portrayed otherwise in mythology? But the answer to that is that the gods were portrayed in many, many different ways in different cultures. There are many cultures, such as the Egyptians, who had what are called theromorphic gods. That is, gods who resemble beasts and animals, not humans. And there are some cultures that have gods who are a combination of the two. Egyptian culture, I suppose, would be actually a better, that would be more of a combination of the two. There are gods who have heads of jackals, as you see in front of you, like Anubis, or a crocodile god, and so on. The fact that the Greeks conceived of their gods as purely anthropomorphic in nature is not a given, therefore, of a polytheistic system. It is simply how the Greeks happen to do it. And I, and I don't want to put too, give too much uh, short shrift to that idea. It was, in some sense, a big improvement. Uh, they saw that the greatest thing on earth was man, human being, anthropos. And so they uh, they imaged their gods as men, as human beings, uh, instead of worshiping frogs and crocodiles and stuff like that. But returning to the point, because they envisioned their gods as anthropomorphic, they understood them to have actual bodies. It is taken for granted that in their natural state, as they appear to one another on Mount Olympus, their bodies are larger, more beautiful, and more glorious than human bodies. 
but they are human-like, just better than human, regular humans. In fact, they are so glorious in their natural state that if a human being were to see a god in his really in reality, in his full divine nature, the human being would go up and smoke. And we actually have uh, uh, plenty of stories about that, about people asking to see the divinity of uh, of a god or goddess and being incinerated uh, on sight. Though their bodies are larger and more beautiful than those of mortals, they do function in anthropomorphic ways. They eat. They eat ambrosia, and they drink nectar, so they don't just eat grain or meat uh, and drink wine, but nevertheless, they do eat and drink things. The gods also have a substance flowing through their veins. We have blood. They were envisioned as having something called ichor, uh, which is never quite explained, but it's like the spe some special fluid that they have instead of blood. So they have fully functioning human-like bodies, and they share many human emotions and passions, both good and bad. However, anthropomorphic though they are, there are also some very big differences between them and human beings. They have the ability to move vast distances, apparently almost instantaneously. When a god wants to appear to a human, he or she can almost do so by just thinking, and they are they and they very do they very often do. They simply appear in front of human beings in many myths, and although their normal appearance is anthropomorphic, they can and do disguise themselves as other creatures or even as non-animate objects. Zeus, in particular, is known for this. He may appear as a bull, a swan. Uh, in one memorable myth, he appeared to a girl locked in a tower as a shower of gold that blew through the window. The defining difference, though, between gods and humans, the one true dividing line between uh, mortals and immortals is just that. The gods are immortal. Humans must die, but gods cannot. One of the most frequent terms used to describe the gods in Greek literature is to call them the athanatoi, the deathless ones, whereas humans are called the thnetoi, the dying ones, or the words... Uh, the, 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 that's the term that is often used to us, those who are bound to death. Even the word mortal in English we don't really feel that so much as English speakers. If you happen to speak Spanish or Italian and you hear the word mortales, the Latin word for mortals, you can hear the word death in there a little bit more readily than we native English speakers do, but for people who only speak English. Um, this helps us understand, though, why the most powerful oath that a god can swear is the oath by the river Styx. S-T-Y-X. When a god swears by the river Styx, the god is bound to do whatever he has sworn, because the Styx is a river that flows around Tartarus, as ocean flows around Gaia, and it is therefore the actual dividing line between the land of the dead inside Tartarus and the land of the living. Since the absolute defining characteristic of a god is that he or she cannot die, an oath sworn on the river sticks is in effect an oath sworn on the essence of what makes a god a god, their immortality, and it is therefore inviolable. And there's examples of this that one sees throughout the Iliad and other Greek literature. In conclusion, then, we have continued our discussion of Hesiod by looking at Zeus's consolidation of power and his unions with various goddesses. In our next lecture, we will turn to the one missing element we have not talked about yet, human beings, and we will see how Hesiod treats them uh, and particularly what he says about the creation of the first man uh, and also the first woman. Thank you.